فاشرف بي لاشتغال بالعلم ولا تبغي به ما عشت يا ذا بدلا ويا له من شرف عظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين له الحمد الحسن والثناء الجميل وشهد لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له يقول الحق وهو يهدي السبيل وشهد ان سيدنا ونبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى اله واصحابه والتابعين لهم باحسان الى يوم الدين اما بعد ان شاء الله تعالى we're going to carry on the explanation of the kitab at-tibyan fi adab hamalat al-quran written by al-imam al-mujtahid al-allama muhyiddin abi zakaria yahya ibn sharaf al-nawawi rahimahu allah the author talks about he spoke previously about muraat al-ma'na fi ibtida' al-qira'ah wa waqfaha observing the meaning when when starting a verse and when stopping at a verse and now we're going to go into the next section inshallah ta'ala naam section instances in which recitation is disliked the recitation of the quran is recommended in almost any situation except certain specific instances where it is either disallowed or discouraged. I will summarize what I recall of such exceptions without mentioning the proofs as they are generally well known. So the author now, he talks about Rahimahullah Ta'ala, situations where reciting the Qur'an is disliked. So the original essence is that reciting the Qur'an is liked and it's recommended. That's the general concept. That the recitation of the Quran is recommended. Illa fi ahwalin maqsusatin jaa sharu bin nahi an al qiraati fiha, except in situation where the Sharia prohibited the recitation of the Quran in it. And the author says, "Wa ana adkur ma hadaran al an minha muqtasar bi hasf al adillati." And he said, "I'm going to mention." That which comes to mind right now, I'm going to summarize it by removing the evidences. Meaning I'm not going to mention the evidences. I'm not going to mention the evidences. And look at this point that the author says which is, وَأَنَا أَذْكُرُ مَا حَضَرَنِي I'm going to mention what comes to mind. And it shows you that Noah we authored this book from memory. He wrote all of this book from memory. He's not relying on any external sources. All of the narrations and all of the quotes and all the ref- references that he's bringing and he's attributing to where he got it from. It seems as though he's getting it from memory. Naam. Recitation is disliked during bowing, prostrating, the tashahud and other positions during prayer except while standing. So it is disliked reading the Quran when you're in ruku', you're in sujood, and we're in the tashahud, you're not allowed to read the Qur'an. But other than that, you can read the Qur'an in the prayer. It is disliked that those praying behind the Imam add anything to Al-Fatiha in prayers where the Imam is reciting aloud, provided that they can hear the Imam. <coughs> also, in the prayer, the only thing that you're allowed to read with the Imam is Surah Al-Fatiha. When it's the prayer that you're reading loud, such as Maghrib, <coughs> Isha and Al-Fajr. Those three prayers are called Salat Jahriya, in which a person reads loudly. Okay, those three prayers you read with the Imam Surah Al-Fatiha. Anything other than Surah Al-Fatiha, one should not read. Now, it is also disliked to recite while relieving oneself or during drowsiness. Now, the author talks about can one read the Quran whilst in whilst doing call of nature is a person allowed to read the quran the shaykh rahimahullah says وتكره, it is disliked whilst the person is on or the person is doing their call of nature for them to read the quran and in also the state where the person is drowsy he feels that he's going to fall asleep the reason why that is not liked or it is not it is not preferred is because halun nuas a person can be reading the ayah in a way that may make the meaning change 
or he may even be cursing himself. Other instances where it is disliked to recite or if the Quran is incomprehensible due to Arabic not being the language of the reciter. If the person believes that they're, they're, they are a foreigner and their knowledge of the Quran is extremely weak, extremely weak, that they may read it very bad, which the meaning will definitely change, then in this situation, it is better that the person does not read it except with the observation of a teacher. That a teacher is with them looking at their recitation. They, 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 that they don't try to read by themselves. Because if they do read by themselves, then this person, it could happen that they memorize it like this and it sticks with them. Or during a sermon for those who can hear it. Also, the person should not read Quran if he can hear the khutbah. So this means that if you can't hear the khutbah, you're allowed to read Quran, even if the khutbah is going on. Or even if the khatib is talking in a different language and you don't understand it, you're allowed to read Quran. If he's talking in Urdu and you don't understand what on earth he's saying, then you're allowed to read Quran. If, however, the sermon is inaudible, it is recommended that the worshiper recite the Quran according to the more correct of the scholarly views. This is the view that he chooses, the Sheikh. While it is reported that Ta'wus disliked recitation during the, during the sermon, it is also reported that Ibrahim did not. It is possible to reconcile between the two opinions in the manner explained above, and this is something that has been stated by our companions. So meaning, if the person can hear the khutbah, he's not allowed to read the Qur'an. And if he can't hear the khutbah, he's not just going to sit there. So he's going to read the Qur'an. If he can hear the khutbah, but the Imam, the khatib, what he's saying, he doesn't understand it, then he's allowed to read the Qur'an or he's allowed to do dhikr. He's allowed to. It is not disliked to recite while, circum while circumambulating the Kaaba and this view is in accordance with our doctrine. So what about reading Qur'an whilst you're doing tawaf around the Kaaba? He says, وَلَا تُكْرَهُ الْقِرَاءَةُ فِي الطَّوَافِ It's not disliked. To read the Qur'an whilst you're doing tawaf around the Kaaba, whilst you're going around the Kaaba. And he said, هذا مذهبنا. That's the madhab of Shafi'iyah. And that's what Imam Shafi'i mentions in his kitab, Al-Umm. He said, وَاسْتُحِبَّ الْقِرَاءَةَ فِي الطَّوَافِ وَالْقِرَاءَةُ أَفْضَلُ مَا تَكَلَّمَ بِهِ الْمَرْءُ It is actually recommended that the person recites Qur'an whilst doing tawaf. Because it's, because it's, because it's the best thing that a person can read This is this is the major, the view of the majority of the ulama, and the one who transmitted this is Ibn al Mundir. Ata from who Ata and Mujahid and Abdullah ibn Mubarak, Abi Thawr and Ashab al Ra'i. He transmitted it from them. Who? Um, Ibn al Mundir is the one who transmitted it. Ashab al Ra'i are Ahlul Kufa, Abu Hanifa, and his madrasa. They're called Ahlul Ra'i. Naam. Al Hassan al Basri, Urwa ibn Zubair and Malik, on the other hand, dislike recitation while circumambulating the Ta'aba, but the first opinion is the more correct of the two. Because this issue goes back to are you allowed to read the Quran whilst walking? And we spoke about this before, right? So it goes back to that issue. And he says that the strongest of the two opinions is the strongest of the two opinions is the opinion of Ata and Mujahid and Abdullah ibn Mubarak and Abi Thawr and Ashab al Ra'i. And the second opinion, which is the opinion of Hassan al Basri and Urwa ibn Zubayr and others, and Malik is weak. Naam. We have already mentioned the different opinions regarding reciting in washing places while on the road and the ruling on reciting when one's mouth contains impurities. So, all of this we spoke about it previously. We spoke about it in page 96 to page 97. The issue, pertain, the issue pertaining to reading the Quran in uh, Sunnah and steam room, for example, or fit tariqi in the path. Um, and also the recitation of the Quran of the one whose mouth is got najas in there. 
في إنكار بعض البدع في القراءة ومن البدع المنكرة في القراءة ما يفعله جهلة المصلين بالناس في الصلاة ما يفعله جهلة المصلين بالناس في التراويح من قراءة سورة الأنعام في الركعة الأخيرة في الليلة السابعة معتقدين أنها مستحبة فيجمعون أمورا منكرة منها اعتقادها مستحبة ومنها إيهام العوام ذلك ومنا تطويل الركعة الثانية على الأولى وإنما السنة تطويل الأولى ومنها التطويل على المأمومين ومن البدع المشابهة لهذه قراءة بعض جهلتهم في الصبح يوم, يوم الجمعة سجدة غير سجدة ألف لام تنزيل قاصدا ذلك وإنما السنة قراءة ألف لام تنزيل في الركعة الأولى وهل أتى في الثانية فصل في مسائل غريبة تدعو الحاجة إليها منها أنه إذا كان يقرأ فعرض له ريع ينبغي أن يمسك عن القراءة حتى يتكامل خروجها ثم يعود إلى القراءة كذا رواه ابن أبي داود وغيره عن عطاء وهو أدب حسن ومنها أنه إذا تثاب أمسك عن القراءة حتى ينقضي حتى ينقضي التثاؤب ثم يقرأ قاله مجاهد وهو حسن ويدل عليه ما ثبت عن أبي سعيد الخضري رضي الله عنه قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إذا تثاءب أحدكم فليمسك بيده على فيه فإن الشيطان يدخل رواه مسلم ومنها أنه إذا قرأ قول الله عز وجل وقالت اليهود عزير بن الله وقالت النصارى المسيح بن الله وقالت اليهود يد الله مغلولا وقالوا اتخذ الرحمن ولدا ونحو ذلك من الآيات فينبغي أن يخفض بها صوتا كذا كان إبراهيم النخعي رضي الله عنه يفعل ومنها ما رواه ابن أبي داود بإسناد ضعيف عن الشعب أنه قيل له إذا قرأ الإنسان إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما أيصلي على النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال نعم ومنها أنه يستحب أن يقول ما رواه أبو هريرة رضي الله عنه عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أنه قال من قرأ والتين والزيتون فقال أليس الله بأحكم الحاكمين فليقل بلى وأنا على ذلك من الشاهدين رواه أبو داود والترمذي بإسناد ضعيف عن رجل أعرابي عن أبي هريرة رضي الله عنه قال الترمذي هذا الحديث إنما يروى بهذا الإسناد عن الأعرابي عن أبي هريرة رضي الله عنه ولا يسمى وروى ابن أبي داود وغيره في هذا الحديث زيادة على رواية أبي داود والترمذي ومن قرأ آخر لا أقسم بيوم القيامة أليس ذلك بقادر على أن يحيي الموتى فليقل بلى وأنا أشهد ومن قرأ فبأ ومن قرأ 
فبأي حديث بعده يؤمنون فليقل آمنت بالله وعن ابن عباس وابن الزبير وأبي موسى رضي الله عنهم أنهم أنهم كانوا إذا قرأ أحدهم سبح اسم ربك الأعلى قال سبحان ربي الأعلى وعن عمر بن الخطاب رضي الله عنه أنه كان يقول فيها سبحان ربي الأعلى ثلاث مرات وعن عبد الله بن مسعود رضي الله عنه أنه صلى فقرا بآخر بني إسرائيل ثم قال الحمد لله الذي لم يتخذ ولد الحمد لله الذي لم يتخذ ولدا وقد نص أصحابنا على أنه يستحب أن يقال في الصلاة أن يقال في الصلاة ما قدمناه في حديث أبي هريرة رضي الله عنه في السور الثلاث وكذا يستحب أن يقال باقي ما ذكرناه وما كان في معناه والله تعالى أعلم. Section forbidding some of the innovations in reciting the Quran. The author here, rahimahullah, and Imam al Nawawi, rahimahullah, he talks about the rejected, I mean, some of the innovations that are rejected and that are considered innovation whilst reading the Quran. And so he states some of them. He says, among the unacceptable innovations in recitation practiced by some ignorant imams during the Rawiyah prayers is the recitation of Surah Al-An'am in the last Raka'ah during the seventh night of Ramadan, thinking that this is recommended. Some people, what they do is, at the time of the author, Rahimahullah, it is, and look what the Shaykh said, Ma yaf'aluhu jahalatu musallin. Some of the ignorant ones do this to the people, which is fit tarawih in the, pray, the tarawih prayer. من قراءة سورة الأنعام. They recite سورة الأنعام in the last rak'ah في الليلة السابعة on the seventh night. معتقدين believing أنها مستحبة. They believe that it's recommended to do this. فيجمعون أمورا منكرة. And in this, they actually combine and they gather in it many rejected matters. منها from them is. In practicing this innovation, they are combined between a number of unacceptable matters. Such matters include believing that this practice is recommended. So, اعتقادها مستحبة. They are believing something that's innovation to be what? Recommended. No, he doesn't like that. Number two. Leading the common folk to believe the same thing. ومنها إيهام العوام ذلك. إيهام means to make the general mass think. العوام is the general folk, the general mass. You're making the general mass think this is the right way when it isn't. Mm -hmm. Making the second rak'ah longer than the first. Again, another, in a, another incorrect thing which is that the Prophet ﷺ, the first rak'ah was the longest rak'ah and the second was less than the first one. But what happens here is that if you read Surah Al-An'am in the last rak'ah, then that means you're making the, la, the la, second rak'ah longer than the first. Keeping others in prayer for an unusually long period of time. Again, this goes against another sunnah, which is التطويل على المأمومين. You're lengthening the prayer and you're making it longer on the general mass. You're making it long on them when it's not the case. ولذلك, what did the Prophet say to Mu'ad? أفتان أنت يا Mu'ad. Mu'ad, are you one who wants to cause trials and tribulation and mischief? What are you doing? You don't lengthen the prayer to the people for so long that they become, uh, they leave the masjid or they, they don't know, they lo no longer want to pray with you. Now. And speeding in recitation so that it turns into babble as opposed to reciting properly. Another thing that happens is the person starts to read it fast. <coughs> Where did he get that from? I don't have that in my, my book. Is it in brackets? Hmm? Is it in brackets? No. I'll stop reading the brackets, please. Yeah, don't read brackets, please. Hmm. 
Another similar innovation is that which equally ignorant imams do by deliberately reciting a sajda other than the sajda recommended for that time. So he reads, he reads, um, in a Fajr prayer he will read Yawm al Sajdatan, which is other than the Surah to Sajda. So he will read, for example, Iqra, Bismi Rabbika Alladhi Khalaq. There's a Sajda in it, right? So we'll get those verses, so those, those surahs that have Sajda in it, other than Surah to Sajda. Indeed, the Sunnah is that Surah to Sajda and Surah to Insan be recited respectively in the first and second Bakas of dawn prayers on Friday. So when Tomorrow Fajr, what should be read is the first Salah Surah to Sajda, all of it should be read, three pages. And then what should be read after that is Surah to Insan. So the first rak'ah should be Surah Sajda and the second rak'ah should be Surah to Insan. And that's how the Prophet was. You shouldn't say to yourself, oh, I'm going to take the first rak'ah and bring any Surah that has Sajda in it. That's another incorrect thing. Now, <laughs> Obscure matters that deserve mention. Here now the author is going to mention some things he believes that are obscure, that are strange, which then there's a need for him to mention. تَدْعُ الْحَاجَةُ إِلَيْهَا and that's the job of a scholar, that when he sees there is a need for something to be brought to the people's attention and it needs clarification that the scholar actually clarifies it and that he doesn't withhold. Now, These include, if the reciter needs to pass wind, he should hold his recitation until he has finished doing so and then continue. This shows good manners towards the Quran and is a practice that has been narrated by Abu Dawood from Afar. If a person needs to pass the wind, <laughs> Uh, because he can't hold it, then uh, he has to part hold from the recitation. Don't recite anymore now. Don't pass wind whilst you're reading the Quran, both at the same time. It's disrespect. So stop, finish passing wind, and then recite the Quran. It's disrespect. So stop, finish passing wind, then go back to the recitation. As Ibn Abi Dawood narrated from Ata, and this, was, this is a good etiquette. So everything is, is clarified to us. You might think to yourself, this is a bit awkward. But the point of the matter is, is that our religion has come to explain everything to us. There is nothing which it left. Every man is that we need. We don't need to take it from, uh, we don't need to go and do a course and, and take a certificate on it and learn it from there. Alhamdulillah, we just need to open the books of First of all, the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the sunnah of the messenger alayhi salatu salam and look at the kalam and the speech of the ulama, the books that they have written and the things that they tell us to do. So when you're reading the Quran and you, you have to pass wind, then stop the recitation of the Quran. Don't read the Quran and pass it at the same time. This is something that's attributed to Ata' um, Naam. A reciter should also stop reciting when he desires to yawn. If you feel like something, the word tatha'uba, tatha'ub it basically means when you're oh, yawning. First of all, the person should actually, when they yawn, you don't let your mouth, you don't just yawn and let your mouth go big and just yawn like that. What you need to do is take your palm, your left hand palm, not the inside but the outside of your palm. Huh? And you put your mouth, you put your hand on your mouth. So you don't, you don't yawn like this, nor do you yawn, especially don't use this hand. You don't use your right hand. You use your left hand and you stop, you yawn with your, you close it, you put your hand on your mouth. Nobody wants to count your teeth. Huh? So what you do is you just cover it, that. Nah. Also try to stop reading. Some people what they're trying to do is, they are yawning, oh, and they're yawning. That's how they read. It's disrespect. Don't yawn and read. Stop this. If you feel like you yawn, you feel like you want to yawn, stop the recitation and yawn. And then continue once he has finished. Then carry on after you've finished your yawning. This is the view of Mujahid and it is a sound opinion. This is something Abu Ubaid Qasim Salam attributes to who? Abu Ubaid Qasim Salam attributes it to, to Mujahid ibn Jabrin. Also Imam al-Ajurri rahimahullah in his kitab Akhlaq Hamalat al-Quran, he attributes it to him as well, Mujahid. Naam. Proof for this point comes from the hadith narrated by Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu anhu. Where, the, where he said that the Messenger of Allah said, If one of you should yawn, then let him cover his mouth with his hand. 
and Satan will enter. So the Prophet told us, alayhi salatu salam, that the Prophet said, إِذَا تَثَاءَبَ أَحَدُكُمْ فَلْيُمْسِكْ بِيَدِهِ عَلَى فِيهِ فَإِنَّ الشَّيْطَانَ يَدْخُلْ That if one of you is wants to yawn, then what he, used, he needs to do is, فَلْيُمْسِكْ بِيَدِهِ عَلَى فِيهِ Cover your mouth with your hand. فَإِنَّ الشَّيْطَانَ يَدْخُلْ Because shaytan will enter your mouth. And the scholars specifically mention what, what hand that you need to use uh, and how that hand should be. The reason is because when what part of your do you use the left side for something good right no you don't what about your right side you reuse it for something good right so, and you use your left side for something bad so they say that the yawning is from who is of it's something from shaitan it's from shaitan so, and that's why the siwak that the scholars mention when you're, do, you're using the miswak to clean your mouth, you woke up in the morning, then you should use your left hand. Are you with me, brothers? Does that make sense? If you're waking up in the morning and you want to use the miswak because you you're woke up and you're trying to clean your mouth, cleaning your mouth from something filthy, which is your saliva and everything, then you should use your miswak with your left hand. Or the brush that you're using, use your left hand. Okay? If you're not lacking, and you're just trying to revive the sunnah and you just within the daytime you just want to every now and then just rub rub, rub the miswak on your mouth just for before the prayer you want to use it before the salah when you do your wudu you just want to run it in your mouth then this is use your right hand because now it's not to clean it because now you're trying to revive a sunnah are you with me brothers because of the hadith of the prophet in all of these affairs, which is the fact that the person is in a state of good, they use their right. And if the person is in a state of something not good that, that is happening to them, then what they need to do is use their left. So the yawning is from the shaytan and that the person should use their left hand. So the Prophet just said hand, but the qa'id according to the scholars is that, it's the left hand. And that the person should then not use the in inside of their hand, but should use the outside of the hand. Allah Muslim narrated that. Naam? It is also recommended that the reciter lower his voice when reading such verses as, as the Jews say, Ezra is the son of Allah, and the Christians say, Jesus is the son of Allah. So, Did the Jews say, who's the son of Allah? Ezra. Ezra, is that what it's called in English? Do they still affirm that today? They reject that. What did they say today? <laughs> I've seen some of them say that, yeah. وَقَالَتِ الْيَهُودُ عُزَيْرُ بْنُ اللَّهِ وَقَالَتِ النَّصَارَ الْمَسِيحُ بْنُ اللَّهِ So Yehud say Uzair is the son of Allah and the Jews they say, the Christians say that Isa ibn Maryam is the son of Allah. So when you come to these verses, the Shaykh Rahimahullah he says, try and lower your voice. Don't say it loudly. And such a verse as, and the Jews said, the hand of Allah is chained. When they say that Allah, Yadullah Maghlula, Allah's hand is chained, meaning Allah is stingy. That's what they're trying to say. Hey? And such as, and they said, the most beneficent has begotten a son. When they said, وَقَالُوا تَخَذَ الرَّحْمَنُ وَلَدَى Allah has taken a child. All of these verses, because it's people who are disrespecting Allah, don't say it loudly, say it low. This is also something that Ibrahim and Nakhari used to do. Ibrahim and Nakhari used to do this. When it came to these verses, they would always read it low. وَقَالَ تَلِيَهُودَ يَزَيْرُ he would make sure that it wasn't loud because these people are disrespecting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it isn't something that you should read loudly. That's what he does. What, that's what Nawawi is trying to say. No. Also among such matters is what Ibn Abi Dawood reported with a big chain of narration stating that a Sha'bi was asked, if a man recites the verse, Allah sends his salat on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his angels too, all you who believe send your salat upon him and greet him in the Islamic way of greeting. Should he stop the presentation and send his salat upon the Prophet? He replied, Yes. So, what do you call it? Sha'bi. But this narration, is, as Nawi mentioned himself, it's weak from Sha'bi. That he was asked if a person recites, Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi, ya ayyu alladina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallim wa taslima. Should he send salutation to the Prophet then? Should he say, Allahumma salli wa sallim ala abdika wa rasulikum? Should he say that? He said, Yes. But it's weak. From who? from Sha'bi. Ibn Abi Shayba in his Musannaf, he narrated from Ibrahim al nakhai That is authentic. 
It is also recommended that the recital practice that which the Prophet prescribed in the hadith narrated by Abu Huraira when he said, Whoever recites Surah Fifteen up to the verse is not Allah the best of all judges, he should say, Yes, as I and I am among those who testify to that. So if the person recites Surah Tutin, the last ayah of Surah Tutin is what? Alayhi sallahu bi ahkamil hakimin. If the person recites that, then he should say, Bala wa ana ala dalika min al shahidin. And I am from those who testify to that. And Imam Abu Dawood narrated this Tirmidhi narrated it bi isnadin da'if. The chain is weak. An rajulin arabiyin from a Bedouin man, an Abi Hurayrata radiyallahu ta'ala anhu. Ibn Abi Dawood and others have also narrated this hadith but with the following addition. And whoever recites the last verse of Surah Al-Qiyamah should say, Yes, and I bear witness to that. And whoever recites the ending of Surah Al-Mursalat, then in what statement after this would they believe? They should say, I believe in Allah. Ibn Abi Dawood narrated and other than him, an extra thing onto that narration itself, which is that, and anyone who recites La Uqsimu Bi Yawm Al-Qiyamah, he should say, Alaysa, the last part of La Uqsimu Bi Yawm Al-Qiyamah, which Allah says, Alaysa Dalika Bi Qadirin Ala An Yuhiya Al-Mawta. The person should say, Bala Wa Ana Ashhad. And anyone who recites for Bi Ayy Hadithin, Ba'adahu Yuminun, he should recite what? He should say, Falyakul Amen to Billah, I believe in Allah. Naam. It is also reported that Ibn Abbas, al Zubayr, and Abu Musa al Ash'ari, may Allah be pleased with them all, would recite the verse, Glorify the name of your Lord the Most High, and say, Glory is to my Lord the Most High. Naam. It is also narrated that Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu would, upon reciting the same verse, say, Glory be to my Lord the Most High three times. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu once led the prayers and recited the end of Surah. فصل في قراءة القرآن يراد بها الكلام ذكر ابن أبي داود في هذا خلافا فروى فروى عن إبراهيم النخعي رحمه الله أنه كان يكره أن يتأول القرآن لشيء يعرض من أمره من أمر الدنيا وعن وعن عمر بن الخ وعن عمر بن الخ وعن عمر بن الخطاب رضي الله عنه أنه قرأ في صلاة المغرب بمكة والتين والزيتون وطور سينين ثم رفع صوته وهذا البلد الأمين وعن حكيم بضم الحاء بن سعد أن رجلا من المحكمة أتى عليا رضي الله عنه وهو في صلاة الصبح فقال لئن أشركت ليحبطن عملك فأجابه علي كرم الله وجهه وهو في الصلاة فاصبر إن وعد الله حق ولا يستخفنك الذين لا يوقنون قال أصحابنا وإذا استأذن إنسان على المصلي فقال المصلي أدخلوها بسلام آمنين فإن أراد التلاوة أو التلاوة والإعلام لم تبطل صلاته وإن أراد الإعلام أو لم تحضره نية بطلت صلاته والله تعالى أعلم. Section regarding reading a verse from the Quran while intending it as casual speech. Somebody talks to another person whilst in the prayer but with Quran. So the person doesn't actually talk to this person, but he responds to him in the salah with Quran. Ibn Abi Dawood narrates different opinions regarding this matter. There's a khilaf in this matter. The person is not speaking a normal speech. They are, they are, what do you call it? They are reading Quran in response. There's a difference of opinion regarding this. Ah, yeah? For instance, it is reported that Ibrahim al Nahari Mela and Versioni used to dislike referring to day to day incidents using verses from the Quran. Ibrahim al Nakhari hated the idea أن يتأول القرآن لشيء يعرض من أمر الدنيا. That the person takes a verse and they make it a conversation and they use it like that. They he used to dislike this. نعم. Ibn Abi Dawood narrates that Ibrahim al Nakhari 
It is reported that Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu recited Surah Al-Qutain during public prayers in Mecca and then raised his voice upon reciting and by this land of security. Hukayn ibn Sa'ad narrated that a man from among the Muhakkima came to Ali ibn Talib while he was praying the dawn prayers and said to him, if you associate partners with Allah, your deeds will be nullified. While in his prayer, Ali replied, be patient. Verily, the promise of Allah is true, and let no, those who have no certainty threaten you. No. In other words, there was a man who had a khawarij tendency. And he said to Ali ibn Abi Talib, in ashrakta la amaluk. And Ali ibn Abi Talib responded to him whilst in the prayer, he said, Fasbir inna wa'ad Allah haq, wa la yastakhifannaka alladheena la yuqinun. Fasbir, be patient. In the word Allah is true. Allah's promise is true. Allah is tachifannaka and do not let them belittle or humiliate you. Alladina la yuqin are those who have no certainty. They don't know what they're talking about. Well, one of the people who was very good at doing this was Muhammad al Amin al Shankiti. I forgot now. There's a story a man came up to him and he gave him food. And when he gave Muhammad al Amin al Shankiti food, he gave him the food and he said to him, he read an ayah in, to him. He said to him, he gave him food and he said to him, Kulu wa sharabu. He said, Kulu, eat. He brought an ayah, in other words, eat, you're from the people of the hellfire. To Muhammad bin Shankirti. And Muhammad bin Shankirti, you got out of, he was lying down, he sat up and he took the food and then he got, he read the ayah for him in response, Rabbana fazidhu adaban. Uh, uh, oh Allah, the one who brought this forward to us, Fazidhu Adaban. He brought the ayah for him. Oh Allah, the one who brought forward this food to us, Fazidhu Adaban. Increase and multiply the punishment for him first. In other words, he was Muhammad al Minish and was somebody like that, who used to be able to read the Quran like that. If no. a man enters upon another man in his prayers and the one praying says, enter it with peace and security, our companions have stated that if the person praying intended to either recite or to both recite and give permission for entry, then his prayer remains valid. If, however, he merely intended to give permission and did not intend to recite, then his prayer is invalidated. So if a person asks permission on a person who is, is, you know, wants to come into your house and they ask permission if they can come in, and then the person is praying, says, Udukhuluha bi salam. He says that. Or oh, he recites, Udukhuluha bi salam in Aminin. If he intended to read that verse and he wants to carry on after that, or if he wanted to read and he also wanted to let you in and give you permission, then his prayer is not nullified. But if he only intended to notify you, or he had no intention whatsoever. Then batalat salatu is salat is nullified in this case, and Allah knows best. He said, "Faslun fi ma yqta' al qira'at qira'at li ajli. Ida kana yqra' ma shi'an, fa marra ala qawm yustahab wa yqta' al qira'at wa yusallim alayhim. Thumma yarjiu ila al qira'at, walau aad al taawud kana hasana, walau kana yqra' jalisan, fa marra alayh ghairu." فقد قال الإمام وأبي الحسن الواحد الأولى ترك السلام على القارئ لاشتغاله بالتلاوة لاشتغاله بالتلاوة قال فإن سلم عليه إنسان كفاه الرد بالإشارة قال فإن راد الرد باللفظ رده ثم استأنف الاستعادة وعاود التلاوة وهذا الذي قاله ضعيف والظاهر وجوب الرد باللفظ فقد قال أصحابنا إذا سلم الداخل إذا سلم الداخل يوم الجمعة في حال الخطبة وقلنا الإنصات سنة وقلنا الإنصات سنة وجب رد السلام على أصح الوجهين فإذا قالوا هذا في حال الخطبة مع الاختلاف في وجوب الإنصات وتحريم الكلام ففي حال القراءة التي لا يحرم الكلام فيها بالإجماع أو لا مع أن رد السلام واجب في الجملة والله أعلم 
وأما إذا عطس في حال القراءة فإنه يستحب أن يقول الحمد لله وكذا لو كان في الصلاة ولو عطس غيره وهو يقرأ في غير الصلاة وقال الحمد لله يستحب للقارئ أن يشمته فيقول يرحمك الله ولو سمع المؤذن فقطع القراءة وأجابه بمتابعته في ألفاظ الأذان والإقامة ثم يعود إلى قراءته وهذا متفق عليه عند أصحابنا وأما إذا طلبت منه حاجة في حال القراءة وأمكنه جواب السائل بالإشارة المفهمة وعلم أنه لا ينكسر قلبه ولا يحصل له شيء من الأذى للأنس الذي بينهما ونحوه, ونحوه فالأولى أن يجيبه بالإشارة ولا يقطع القراءة فإن قطعها جاز والله تعالى أعلم فصل في استحباب القيام لأهل الفضل من العلماء والصالحين وإذا ورد على القارئ من فيه فضيلة من علم أو صلاح أو شرف أو سن مع صيانة أو له حرمة بولاية أو ولادة أو غيرهما فلا بأس بالقيام له على سبيل الاحترام والإكرام لا للرياء والإعظام بل ذلك مستحب وقد ثبت القيام للإكرام من فعل رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وفعل أصل وفعل أصحابه رضي الله عنهم بحضرته وبأمره ومن فعل التابعين ومن بعدهم من العلماء والصالحين وقد جمعت جزءا في القيام وذكرت فيه الأحاديث والآثار الواردة باستحبابه وبالنهي عنه وبينت, الضع وبينت ضعف الضعيف منها وصحة الصحيح والجواب عما يتوهم منه النهي وليس فيه نهي ووضحت ذلك كله بحمد الله تعالى فمن شك في شيء من أحاديثه فليطالعه يجد ما يزول به شكه إن شاء الله تعالى